I'm out here at um, Haven of Hope in Argyle, Texas. And the theme for this retreat is write your story. And one of the things that I enjoy doing as a teacher um, are object lessons. And as I was looking through the photos that were posted of your theme, I saw a picture of this beautifully classic typewriter. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about how to give you some truly applicable things that you can walk away here with that there are, there are four key elements of old typewriters from which we can gather um, things that, um, that are applicable in our lives. And so I want, to, um, I want to use the typewriter to share some of those with you. Now, I realize that no one, for the most part, is typing on an old traditional typewriter anymore. You know, we're typing on our phones, on tablets, on, you know, word processors and the computer. Um, you know what, though? The, the old typewriters are part of our history. And that there are many valuable lessons from looking at history and the things that make up our history. And um, I, I always enjoy um, learning um, about um, things um, in our history or just learning about new things. So I spent some time last night researching um, old typewriters. And I want you to know going into this that when I was, um, <clears throat> I, I learned how to type as a seventh grader. And it was, they were on electric type, um, typewriters. But when I moved in with my mother as a sophomore in high school, um, my mother had uh, an old manual typewriter, not even as nice as this, really. And I typed my papers for the next year and a half on that old manual typewriter. So I have history with um, these old manual typewriters. And I, I can remember when she bought me that electric brother. It was so nice. I could type so much faster. Um, but I want to share with you some things about um, this old typewriter and how um, you can use it to apply um, some lessons in your life. OK, so the, there are basic components. I'm going to really. Um, narrow this down. There are many parts to a manual typewriter, but I, so I'm narrowing this down for our time. <clears throat> we are going to look at the paper. We are going to look at what's called the platen or the cylinder. That's this portion here that moves back and forth um, as you are typing. We are going to look at, kind of in one cohesive group, the ribbon, which provides the inking, the keys, um, that you have um, here. We're going to look at um, all of those, and we're going to look at the space bar, um, which is, I realize it's part of the keys, but we're going we're to kind of highlight that. And then the fourth area that we're going to look at is this carriage um, return here. Um, so the idea of um, these um, parts to your mechanical typewriter, I want to share with you um, some different aspects um, about them as we look at some ways to apply the writing of your story. So let's first look at the paper. So the paper is necessary. You need paper to roll into that typewriter so that you have a medium on which those letters to transfer as you're typing. I want you to think of the paper as your heart and your mind, your very life is the paper of your story. And what's interesting is that in the Old Testament, they recorded God's word on stones of tablet. In the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Paul talks about how they once recorded them on tablets, but now through the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God is writing these words on your heart, on the flesh. And so I want you to think of your very heart and your mind as the paper that is necessary for your written story. And as such, it's important for you to know not only who you are, but also whose you are. Both of those are significant as the story is being written. Important to know who you are, that you can appreciate 
the really the uniqueness of how God has created you. You know, he chose to create man and woman. In his image, he created them, male and female. God in his design had those two definitive options. So the fact that he created you male for our men in the room or female for our ladies in the room is significant. It's part of God's design for your story. He gave you a temperament, whether you're choleric, melancholy, sanguine, or phlegmatic, how you perceive the world and interact with the world. He gave you a bent towards a particular love language, how you show love and receive love. He has created you uniquely, so knowing who you are is important. And I think that one of the great things about associating with a company like Premier is that oftentimes you are given resources that you otherwise would never know about, like how do you find out what your temperament is? You, you, there are resources available to you that would allow you to better understand that. You know, the fact that I know that I'm a list maker, get her done, you know, kind of my way or the highway, <laughs> I mean, really, that's kind of the, you know, the approach, and I'm married to a man who is detail-oriented. He's the researcher, he's the analyzer, he's the thinker and the processor. You know, so we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. The fact that we understand those differences helps us in how we interact and engage with each other. You know, understanding the temperaments of our young men who are growing and, you know, we're, we're trying to parent them and shepherd their heart. It's helpful to know who you are. And that includes really embracing all the parts of your story leading up to where you are right now. And, you know, as I was sharing with you um, when I was talking about my story, you know, about um, my parents and, and the experiences that I had growing up, all of those are significant in the who that I am. Overshadowing, though, that ideally is the whose you are. And the challenge, I believe, especially in our country, is that you have a lot of options about whose you are. You know, you, and in, in, in a sense, what I mean when I say whose you are is to whom do you belong? For some people, they belong to their family or they belong to their, you know, their, their, they're identified with their spouse or their kids, or they belong to a group or an organization, or they belong to a cause. Um, so you can belong to many things. What I'm proposing to you, though, and what I have learned in my own life is that first and foremost... I need to belong to God, my Father, my Creator, the person in whose image I was crafted by Him. And so as we look at who I am, who you are, and whose we are, the challenge is we need to have assurance that I am. I belong to my Heavenly Father, and that comes through engaging in a personal relationship with Him. The difference between saying, I believe God, and I believe Jesus, and I know Jesus died on the cross, and, you know, when I say that, when I've asked people in the past, if you were to die today, how sure are you, so on a scale of 0 to 100, how sure are you that when, if you were to die today, that you would be able to stand before a holy and perfect God and that he would confidently say to you, enter in to my perfection, and we know that as heaven. And, then, and, and I've had people tell me 50%, 70%, 80%. People saying, I'm not really sure. And ultimately, that when people have said to me, 100%, 100%, I know that God's going to say that. And my follow-up question is this, on what basis do you know that? On what basis do you know that? Because it, it's not enough to just have the head knowledge 
that head knowledge has to indeed travel into heart knowledge and the spirit has to have written that on the flesh of your heart that Jesus Christ in his death on the cross and in his, his true physical death to provide payment that you are unable to make for the imperfection that exists, that you were born into, your heredity from Adam and Eve, that Jesus has taken care of that. And even more importantly, he was buried in the grave and that he was raised again, the only leader in all every, look at every religion out there in the world. Jesus is the only one that claims resurrection and he didn't die again. It's very important that you understand that. That is a defining difference between Christianity and all other religions. When you are aligning yourself with, when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not joining a cause. You are not joining an organization. Some would tell you you're joining a church, but I would say to you, that's really only effective your desire to be in you know, connection with other believers. No, when you come into a relationship with Christ, it's just that. You are coming into relationship. And you are allowing God to change you from the inside out. And so knowing whose you are is important. And in knowing who you are and whose you are, we cannot escape the significance of your mind and your thoughts in that process. Remember I said that your, in, your inadequacies inside will always show up outside, okay? You cannot escape them. Listen, I was taught, put your feet apart, spread your arms apart, and repeat after me. You don't need to repeat after me, but this is, I was taught this. I was taught to do this. I feel happy. I feel healthy. I feel terrific. And that, you know, this is how you're going to start your day, and it's going to set the course of your mind, and it sounds really good until you have the miscarriage or you have the, the job loss where you have absolutely no income. Or, and I, I'm telling you, you can stand up all you want and repeat these positive things, but without an anchoring in your life, they will fall short. And so if you cannot address what's really happening in your mind and in your thoughts, then it will cause you to be derailed because your thoughts are foundational. So what, what I want to say to you for the purpose of time, if, if in the hearing of my voice, if I asked you to think about how would you characterize your thought life, would you characterize it as a struggle against negativity, against, um, you know, this, this challenge of believing God is who he says he is and God can do what he says he can do, a, a, a challenge and believing that the world is, you know, against me, that my life is a struggle, or would you characterize your thinking as positive, God-word, Bible-focused, if, if, how you answer that, if you're anywhere on more on this side of the spectrum, I'm going to encourage you to go to that Glitzy Gems YouTube channel and look up Transformed Thinking because it will be an hour of your life that will walk you through six different things to help you process and think about your thinking. How, how do I think and how can I partner, come alongside God and allow him to transform my thought life? And so worthwhile, such an important passion of mine. Um, so I want to challenge you to do that if thinking is a challenge for you. So that's your paper. The second aspect of the mechanical typewriter is this platen. Um, the platen is this hard surface here. It's the cylinder on which that paper is rolled up. Now what's interesting is that this is necessary to provide a smooth surface of the paper so that as those keys strike up and hit the ribbon, they can be transferred onto the actual paper. So this is an actual very important aspect of your, um, of your typewriter. Um, now the thing about the, I want you to think of the platen and the cylinder as your circumstances, okay? Your circumstances. What they provide for you here 
is they provide a guide. Now, if, if I were to take this piece of paper out, you would see a metal framing over here that actually provides the left margin of the paper. It provides a guide so that as you roll that paper in, it's designed to give you a firm left margin. It's providing a boundary of your paper. And then on this side, it will stop according to where it's been set so that you're typing within a certain margin. Well, see, your circumstances are the same for you. Your circumstances, in effect, are God's way of providing a boundary of what's occurring in your life right now. Those circumstances are the boundary in which your story is being written. Early on in my life, my story was being written through the boundary of divorce and remarriage and what that looked like in my life. Through the circumstance of moving from my father's home into my mother's home, into a new set of circumstances, those provided certain boundaries, circumstances in which my story was being written. And then going on to college, you see the idea, your circumstances are providing boundaries. So here's the thing, that platen, this cylinder is necessary. It is necessary that it's hard so that it's a good striking surface for the keys. So let me just put those two together. Do you realize the best set of circumstances most often are hard circumstances because it's in the hard circumstances that your life, your heart, your flesh becomes the ideal place on which God can strike his principles, his truths, his word onto the flesh of your heart in order to change and transform you. Do not dislike hard circumstances because it is through them that God can write the story of your life in a beautiful way that will draw people in and allow them to connect with you in ways that you never thought possible. I encourage you to embrace them because Paul did. If we want to look at a biblical example, Paul embraced circumstances. In Philippians, where he's writing from a prison cell, chained to a guard, and the, the whole book communicates such a joy that he had about his relationship with Jesus. You know, there's a little passage tucked away in Philippians chapter 4. Most people know chapter 4, verse 13. They can quote it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what's interesting is you rarely hear people start in verse 11, which is what led Paul to verse 13 where he says, not that I speak in regard to need, but I have learned to be content no matter my circumstances. No matter my circumstances. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound in everything, and at all times I know what it means to be hungry, and I know what it means to be full, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the question is, are you willing to embrace the circumstances in which God is not surprised that you're in, in order that your heart, your flesh, is in the most ideal place for God's truth to be written on it? And so embrace those tough circumstances. Okay. The next area that I want to talk about is the ribbon, the keys, and the space bar. So the ribbon is infused with ink so that as the, the bar comes up to strike through the ribbon, it transfers the formation of that letter, the form of that letter, onto the paper. I want you to think of the ribbon as God's word. God's word is the ink. God's word is where we need to be on a daily basis so that that truth can be inked on the very core of who we are. That truth can be infused into our mind so that our foundational thoughts are not worldly thoughts. They're not our family's thoughts. They're God's thoughts in the sense that God is anchoring who he is, what he can do, the truths of his word in our mind. 
part of what I realized when I, 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 after I came to that, I believe God for my salvation, but I believe him for very little beyond that. What I realized is because I don't really, I truly don't know a whole lot about God. Yes, I know about Noah, and I know about Daniel and the lion's den, and I know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego coming through the fire, and I know about people in the New Testament. But could I tell you the attributes of God and what they meant? No, only a handful. So when I really started studying God, and what does it mean to be omniscient, to know all things at all times, to be omnipresent, that he is in all places at all times, no matter what, to be omnipotent, that he has all power, he is able to do all things, that he is sovereign over all of the affairs, that he has providence in your life, that he is has he is merciful and loving and just. When you begin to really look at who God is, then so much more of what you read in Scripture can impact you in a greater way because you have an expanded perspective on this Creator who brought you into existence, has given you amazing and timeless truths on which you can base your life and trust that they indeed will guide you along the path that he has for you, along the best path for that word. The key striking the ribbon. They transfer the letters to the paper. Here's what I know. When I was, when I was working with the, um, the mechanical keys, I had a finger workout. Like, you're, you, had, you had to, like, you couldn't be half-hearted in your stroke, right? Because otherwise it would make for a faint letter. Anybody, ha- I mean, if, you, if you've used it, you'll know. And so it required effort on my part. So what does that look like for us? If we're going to be striking the keys in order to transfer these letters to our paper, I need to actually do my part. Here are some things that I think are important about doing our part. Write down 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. It says, Our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty to demolish every stronghold that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Our part looks like being in the word of God. It is the sword of the spirit. It is our offensive weapon, according to Ephesians 6, when we talk about um, the armor of God. It is our offensive weapon, and it is mighty to demolish every stronghold that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What stronghold are you dealing with? I'll be business specific. Do you have a stronghold of no one wants to have a show? Well, then you've got to knock through that. I want you to think sledgehammer to the brick wall in order to break through it. And you have got to break through. You have got to demolish that stronghold that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, that God gave you premier, that God can give you the words to say, that God can give you the ears to hear, that God can give you the eyes to see the people whose lives can be impacted by premier. you got to demolish that thing. And you've got to take those thought captives. I'm no good at booking. If that's coming out of your mouth, you, you've got to think, is that, is that thought, I'm no good at booking, business building, or business busting? And if it's not building my business, I have got to reject that thought, and I've got to replace it with the truth of God's word. That's part of transformed thinking that you're going to find on Glitzy Gems. It's our part. God isn't just going to go, And next thing you know, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I always feel red flag. Red flag meaning it it, it concerns me. It it gives me a sense of concern when I I am interacting with someone where everything is Pollyanna. That everything is, oh, it's so good, and everything is so good, and I have no issues, and my life is perfect. And why? Because I... I realize that life is hard. We live in a fallen world. We have an enemy who is working against us. And so we have to do our part, and part of our part is taking those thoughts captive. The other thing that I would recommend is is our part is filtering our thoughts through the truth of God's Word. I like to use Philippians 4.8, which says, Whatever things are true, 
Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is anything of virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And so you've got to filter the thoughts that you're having through the truth of God's word so that you can understand what to reject and how to replace. It is not enough if I said to you, don't think the color blue. What did you just think? The color blue. You see, what we get into is we get, we get all these self-help books that say you should think positive thoughts right? And don't think this stuff. Don't, don't focus on the challenge of your childhood. Don't focus on. And what are people focusing on? All of these things that are not helping them to focus on the Lord. The challenge with all the self-help um, books on the shelves that we have today is most of it has nothing to do with the truth of God's word and everything to do with the truth that someone wants to make it. Because if I declare it as truth, for sure it must be true, right? Because that's what's happening in our world today. We, we, are, we are moving away from a true standard of timeless truth to a it's relative to everyone truth. And the challenge with that is there will always be something that trumps it. And the next thing you know, you got to create some more new truth. And so what I'm saying to you is our part is you got to know the truth, you got to apply the truth, you got to filter the truth of God's word to your thoughts. That is your part. That is striking those keys. As you do that, and that that paper is on that tough circumstance, you know, your of your life, God is writing his truths onto your heart in such a way that it makes a difference. Okay, the other part of this is the space bar that I wanted to talk to you about. And so cool how God works. Having a conversation with a friend of mine about their, their situation, their circumstances, some challenges that they've had. And something that I have learned is that God gives you checks in your spirit, okay? That moment when the spirit within you goes, whoa, you need to, you need to stop and you need to pause, Stop and pause. Stop and pause. If there is question in your mind, don't. Okay? If there is question in your mind, don't. So I was sharing this with her, and I was, I was talking about the, that pause. There is value in the pause. And she goes, that, that'd be a really good training. And so I'm like, you know, you're right. That would be a really good training. So I, have, I keep a dry erase marker in our bathroom, and I write things on my mirror, notes to myself, notes of encouragement, our vision for just our daily living and our business. And I wrote on the mirror, the power of pause. And it's been sitting there because I wasn't sure what God wanted to do with that. So last night when Fred and I were talking about this space bar, he goes, oh, you'll be able to talk about the power of pause. I was like, oh, you're so good. <laughs> oh, what was my hashtag? Be like Fred. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the space bar. Have you ever considered the space bar is the largest of the keys on your keyboard? The value of the space bar, it can, be, it can be accessed by both the right hand and the left hand. So no matter which side you're on, you can actuate the space bar. The space bar is significant because once a word is typed, a space is needed to provide that, that moment, that pause, so that the sentence can be readable so that the words can have a space in between, and that becomes significant. So I want to talk to you even just briefly about the power of pause. That if we don't allow space in our life, it's going to be very difficult to hear the voice of God, to, to be able to discern God as we read his word, if we have so much crumpled up, running together, letters and words in our life. We need space. We need pause in our life. That's the beauty of Haven of Hope. 
is it takes you away from the television. It takes you away from all of the cares and stresses of your daily living. Why? It gives you a moment of pause. It gives you the ability to hear God in a more clear way because this property is anointed. This property, when you walk onto it, it's hard not to immediately feel the presence of God here, to sense that something is different, that he is here in a more tangible way because of what they choose to do and how they promote him here. So that space is so important. You need space. I'm going to encourage you, do not overlook what the Holy Spirit is able to do in your life to give you that moment of pause. Space bar is is, is significant. The last piece, and I'll wrap it up, is the carriage return. So that platen, that cylinder, needs a way as you're typing and it's moving over from the right to the left, not only do you need to be able to move the platen back in place for the next line to be typed, but it also increases the space of the paper up so that you get to the next line for it to be written. So this is very interesting. What that? So there's a couple of things that I want to point out about the carriage return. That one, the paper is always moving. It's always moving. In order for the typing to be effective, the platen has to be moving. You need to be moving in your life. It's the moment when you sit still and you think, I've done all I can do. I don't want to do any more. I'm tired. This isn't worth it. I, I, I just don't want to move from where I am. I want you to imagine that that's where all of those Striker bars just start hitting one on top of the other and all you have is a jumbled mess of letters that you cannot discern. And what happens is when we get to that place in our life where I call it when I want to have my little temper tantrum, where I'm just like, that's fine, God. I don't like this. I'm I'm just going to sit myself right here and I'm not doing a thing. And then I wonder why I don't like the results of that little, you know, toddler attitude that I'm presenting. Because life is about moving forward. God is moving you forward. Time is not stopping. He is going to move you forward in your circumstances because he has a greater plan than he, it's even possible for us to comprehend. One in which we are significant, but we are not the most important. It is not all about us. It is about his story, his plan, what he's accomplishing in the scope of his kingdom. And so we have to Um, have that necessary movement. Philippians 3, 12 and 14, Paul gives us, I think, a great scripture that helps us to see the significance of movement because Paul, here he is in a jail cell. He is chained. I mean, he would have rather been out traveling, ministering to the population, the, 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 the churches that he had helped to start and that he had mentored and encouraged. But no, he's in these circumstances. They have bound him. He cannot travel. But he is saying, not that I have already obtained or I'm already perfected. No, not not that at all. But what I do is I press on toward the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. And oh, by the way, he says, forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead, which is the that upward call, that goal towards the upward call of Christ Jesus. That's how you have to see it. No matter how tough your circumstances are right now, whether you're getting what you are, you had hoped for, when you're, whether you're seeing the results of the efforts that you're making, or God has you in waiting, whatever it is, you have to believe and know and trust and move forward in confidence that God is accomplishing his perfect plan in your life. Moving forward. And by the way, the timing is important. Okay, so the carriage return is designed that once you get to the end of the line, then you strike the carriage bar and it moves the um, platen back over and the paper goes up a line. Sometimes our challenge, though, is we don't want the whole line written. We don't like the path that God has us on. We want to hit the carriage return sooner. We want to start a new story. We want to skip the pain. We want to skip the challenge. We want to start fresh. We want to start over. What, however you characterize it, all I'm saying to you is the timing of the carriage return in the story of your life is significant. And God is always the best at determining 
when it's time to start writing the next line of your story. Don't be quick to want to move on without letting that come to fulfillment. He gives you the power to choose, by the way. So my challenge to you is yield to his choosing for you. Yield to his choosing for you. You see, as I had said before, God's story is designed to be my story. It's designed to be your story. You know, Fred and I, on the way here, we were listening to um, Big Daddy Weave. To tell you my story is to tell you of him. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Justice was served and where mercy wins. To tell you of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell you of him. And then it breaks in to one uh, just a tremendous old hymn. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. The beautiful thing about the typewriter is that letter after letter, a word is written. Word after word, a sentence formed. Sentence after sentence, a paragraph printed. Paragraph after paragraph, a chapter formed. Chapter by chapter, a life lived. A story well written, a legacy formed. Write your story in such a way that it shows others how you've allowed God's story to be your story and long after your life here on earth is done, your story is still being told to the generations that follow. Thank you. Thank you.